For the Strahl family of Canastotta, South Dakota, Monday, July 29, 1996, was not an ordinary day. They eagerly anticipated celebrating their son Nathan's second birthday that evening. Before leaving for work at the Southeastern Children's Center in Sioux Falls, Piper Strahl, 28, was getting ready to drop off Nathan and Shina, her three-year-old daughter, to their babysitter. Less than three hours ago, her 29-year-old husband Vance went for his plumbing work. Piper, Shina, and Nathan were still in the Strails trailer when a man entered somewhere around 9.30 a.m. The kids saw Piper and the man engage in a violent struggle at some time. Shina and Nathan were left by themselves, completely traumatized by what they had witnessed, when the intruder took Piper. Vance tried to contact his house that afternoon, but nobody picked up. At around 3 p.m., Patty Sinclair, a daycare provider at the Southeastern Children's Center, called the residents. Due to Piper's absence from the office, Shina's sobbing panicked phone answer caught Patty off guard. Shina asserted that they were the only ones in the home when Patty inquired about the presence of others. Little Shina's comment that her parents were probably dead before hanging up further stunned Patty. When Patty returned the call, Shina sobbed frantically and stated she didn't want her parents to die. Court records state that Shina told Patty that her mother went in a black car with a man she knew. Patty tried to comfort the young girl who had been terrified for about 45 minutes while she was on the phone. Patty gave a co-worker the task of getting in touch with the sheriff's office while she spoke with Shina. A little after five o'clock, Sheriff Jean Taylor showed up at the Strail's residence. The trailer door was open, as Taylor had noticed. When he entered, the living space was in a chaotic state, which suggested that a conflict had taken place. Along with other household things, the contents of Piper's pocketbook were spread out around the floor. Shina was unhurt but crying as Taylor entered the bedroom at the trailer's back. Nathan, a two-year-old who was also unharmed, was groggy as he walked. There was no sign of Piper. Taylor had a sneaking suspicion that the kids had been abandoned for a while. Shina was questioned about what transpired that day by Taylor and Jim Stevenson, a state criminal investigator who was brought to the scene. The young child reportedly said, Mommy's going to die, and according to Roy Hazelwood and Stephen G. Mycord's dark dreams, a mean man entered the trailer, argued with their mother, and shot his gun. Piper begged Shina and Nathan to flee and hide because she thought the man may hurt her kids, but the intruder seized her and sped off in his black automobile. The young girl reportedly remembered the stranger stealing Nathan's blue tent birthday present before departing. Vance returned home a little more than an hour after Sheriff Taylor arrived. Shina flung herself into her father's arms and started crying right away. Shina was questioned about what transpired, but communication was challenging due to her tension from the day's events. He could only deduce that a man had entered and taken Nathan's tent and that her mother wouldn't be returning. When Vance acquired additional information from the sheriff and Stevenson, his worry escalated to fear. His wife had gone missing. All he could do was console his children and pray that Piper would be discovered alive by the authorities. Vance remembered a crucial detail three days after Piper was kidnapped, and he shared it with the police. It would turn out to be the break they all needed. It would enable the capture of one of the most heinous sadist killers in South Dakota. On July 29, Vance reported to the police a man he remembered seeing at their home a few days before his wife vanished. Rob Anderson, a balding man in his twenties, visited their trailer at 7.30 in the morning on the 26th of July to ask about getting his kids into the Bible camp that Vance and Piper ran every July. According to Vance, Anderson appeared astonished to see him, as if he hadn't anticipated that he would be at home. After Anderson got over his shock, he asked a quick question about the camp. Vance sent him to Piper, who informed him that the program had ended for the summer but recommended he register his children for the following year. Anderson nodded in agreement and, before departing, 
noted his name and contact information. The details Vance provided to the police prompted them to launch an investigation right away. Robert Leroy Anderson, age 26, a maintenance worker at the meat processing plant of John Morell and Company, was their new suspect. They also discovered that Anderson had four kids and had been married twice. When questioned by police throughout their inquiry, several witnesses said they had seen a black truck near the Strails trailer home on the day Piper vanished. A highway worker who was one of the witnesses told police that he spotted a black Bronco three times that day, once around 9.45 a.m., once more around an hour later, and once more at 12.30 p.m. Investigators learned from a neighboring couple that at approximately 11.45 a.m. they saw a black Bronco on the day in question, not far from the Strails trailer. The neighbors observed the truck again about an hour later and noticed China and Nathan standing alone by the roadside, looking upset, according to court filings. They saw a man in a black baseball cap and pants walking from the Strails house while standing in front of the driveway. Anderson agreed to be interrogated at the police station when he was asked to do so by investigators on July 30. Anderson resolutely acknowledged visiting the Strails trailer four days earlier after almost eight hours of questioning that was captured on camera. He admitted to returning to the Strails home on July 29 to ask permission to use the archery range on their property, but no one answered the door, so he left. Despite not having a confirmed alibi for July 29, he did inform detectives that day. Anderson denied having any knowledge of Piper's kidnapping or whereabouts. They would eventually discover his lies. Investigators obtained a warrant to search Anderson's blue Bronco and house while he was being questioned by the police. They came to some of the most damning evidence ever gathered against Anderson throughout their quest. Regrettably, it would not reveal Piper's location. Investigators found many receipts for duct tape, black water-based tempera paint, paintbrushes, and a bucket while searching Anderson's truck. The majority of these purchases were made a few days before and on the day Piper vanished. Investigators believed that Anderson's Bronco was covered up using the paint. It would turn out that their suspicions were true. To further thoroughly examine the truck's paint work, they brought in experts. Chemical analyses were performed on the samples. They discovered that the Bronco had been painted using the same paint that Anderson had purchased on or about July 29. It was simple to apply and remove the paint that was used. It's interesting to note that a witness said he saw Anderson polishing his car on the day Piper vanished. It was assumed he washed the paint off the car and removed any other potentially damaging evidence. But he didn't complete the task completely. Investigators discovered more damning evidence inside the Bronco. They found a platform made of wood with holes punched into it. It was assumed that it was designed as a restraint tool, with metal hoops placed strategically across the board, into which a person's hands and ankles might be bound. The platform was just the right size to fit inside the truck's bed. Additionally, the sleuthing team discovered hairs clinging to the wooden platform that were genetically identical to Piper's. Additionally, his truck was found to contain a dirty shovel, straps for lifting furniture, weeds, a toolbox, and dog hairs that resembled those of the Strails dog. It was becoming more and more obvious that Anderson was not all that he seemed to be in the police station. Investigators went to Anderson's Sioux Falls residence and discovered a pair of jeans in his washing basket. They had what seemed to be blood stains on them. The jeans were brought to a police laboratory for examination. They discovered that Anderson's or his family's DNA was not present in the blood sample. It was assumed that it was Piper's blood. They discovered semen stains on the genes as well, but due to the little sample size available for testing, they were unable to genetically link them to Anderson. Investigators also found a set of handcuff keys at his house during the search. Anderson, though, angrily denied having a set of handcuffs. Anderson was able to depart after being questioned. However, the police were very certain that he was responsible for Piper's kidnapping. Just more evidence was required to support their claims. Shiner and Vance were summoned to the police station the same day as Anderson's interview to examine a six-photo lineup. One of the images was of Anderson with long hair and a moustache, 
a scene on an old driver's license. The man who had visited Shiner and Vance's home was unknown to them. Shiner and Vance were asked to go back to the police station to see more pictures around two days later. The photographic lineup once more contained Anderson's image. This time, they provided a more recent image of him showing shorter hair and a clean-shaven appearance. Vance quickly identified the image of Anderson as the visitor to the residence on July 26. Separately, Shiner chose the same image and recognized him as the man who abducted her mother. The accurate identification provided the Sioux Falls police with the proof they required to prosecute Anderson. He was detained on two counts of kidnapping on August 2, 1996. Due to the lack of a body, they were unable to accuse Anderson of murder. The police began a huge search for Piper and any other information that would help prove Anderson's guilt of murder in September of that year. They intended to guarantee that he would serve the entirety of his sentence in prison. Numerous volunteers were used to assist in the search of the wooded area near the Big Sioux River in Baltic, South Dakota. Several important artifacts were uncovered while looking for evidence. A blouse with the code zero insignia on it, cut in half, was discovered. The blouse Piper was wearing on the day she vanished was still there. On July 29, a guy found the remaining half of the black and white striped shirt on a road close to the Baltic. He initially believed it to be a referee shirt, but when he realized it wasn't, he placed it in the back of his car and promptly forgot about it, according to court filings. When he learned the significance of the clothing, he later gave it to the police. A roll of duct tape with human hairs attached to it was discovered close to the Big Sioux River where a piece of the shirt was discovered. After further examination, it was discovered that the hair matched samples obtained from Piper's hairbrush. Additionally, the roll of duct tape found in Anderson's truck two months prior matched the roll of tape confiscated from the scene. Around the river, more horrifying physical proof was found, such as many lengths of rope and shackles, eye bolts, a vibrator, and a half-burned candle. The objects were thought to have been used to torture Piper. Additionally, they offered convincing proof that Anderson was a sadist. Anderson was tried in May 1997 for kidnapping Piper and was found guilty. He was ultimately given a life sentence at the South Dakota State Penitentiary. Hazelwood and Michael believed there was sufficient evidence to conclude that Anderson was a sadist who got a kick out of his victim's anguish and powerlessness. Four things formed the basis of their judgment. Anderson showed obvious interest in bondage, a hallmark of a sadist, which was symbolized by the shackles, dildo, partially burned candle, eye bolts, handcuff keys, duct tape, and plywood platform. It was speculated that after Piper was kidnapped, Anderson drove her to a rural location close to Baltic based on the evidence that was discovered by police that clearly indicated physical torture. He may have abused her there after duct taping her mouth shut, duct taping her to the platform, ripping off her shirt, and torturing her meticulously with a dildo and a candle. The next step is thought to have been Piper's murder. Anderson acknowledged to the police and his acquaintances that he liked anal intercourse, which his wife did not. The dildo was utilized by Anderson to act out his fantasy, according to research by Hazelwood and Mycord that revealed sadists prefer this form of intercourse. Sadists, it was further argued, habitually plan their crimes in much greater detail than do other criminals. Jamie Hammer, one of Anderson's long-standing acquaintances, presented evidence that gave investigators fresh details about Anderson's predatory and sadistic tendencies. Piper was not his only victim, they discovered. They also understood that if he hadn't been arrested, he would have probably kept preying on women. Hammer testified in police interviews that he had known about Anderson's fixation with torturing and killing women as early as high school. Hammer found the idea intriguing, and the two frequently discussed how to commit the ideal crime. Over time, as their chats developed and became more in-depth, so did their fantasies. The two guys quickly made the decision to play them out. Actually, Anderson and Hammer had a joint plan to kidnap a woman. According to Hazelwood and Mycord, the two men obtained Will Poppers and set them on the road. They waited for a victim to pass by before running over the Poppers and injuring themselves. 
they decided to attack the unwary woman at that point. Anderson had previously pre-selected a victim, Amy Anderson, age 26, not related to Robert Leroy Anderson, which Hammer was unaware of. In accordance with Anderson's plan, Amy drove over the wheel poppers in November 1994 while returning from a friend's house close to T, South Dakota. She drove off the road to fix her flat tire as soon as it happened. Anderson grabbed her and took her off the road and into the woods as she went into her trunk for a spare tire. Fortunately, Amy was able to escape and signal a passing vehicle to stop and pick her up. Amy's attempted kidnapping was an open investigation for two years until a breakthrough was made. Amy's case was once more in the spotlight in 1996 when Anderson was on trial for kidnapping Piper. In a police lineup, she was able to recognize Anderson, although he would never be put on trial for the crime. He had already been found guilty of stealing Piper at the time. Anderson's other pal Glenn Marcus Walker would bear the brunt of it instead. As it turned out, he was also a part of Anderson and Hammer's botched attempt to kidnap Amy. He admitted to the crime during his trial several years later. But he would also admit to other crimes he and Anderson had committed. Investigators found that Anderson and Walker had perpetrated another, more horrible crime months before Amy was attacked. Larissa, then 29, and Bill Domansky relocated from Ukraine to South Dakota in 1991. They both started working at the John Morrell and Company meat packaging facility because they were eager to begin a new life in the United States. Bill eventually found employment elsewhere, while Larissa stayed on with the business, primarily working the night shift. She made a friend with Robert Leroy Anderson, the plant's maintenance worker, there. Anderson revealed to his long-standing buddy Glenn Walker, who shared a similar passion with Hammer, about his horrific murder fantasies. They both desired a taste of what it would be like to kidnap and murder a woman. Together, they came up with a complex scheme to kidnap Larissa. For some months ago, Anderson had been pursuing her. In order to kidnap Larissa once she stopped, Anderson and Walker set will poppers along the road particularly to puncture her tires. But at first, their plan didn't go as they had intended. In fact, Larissa had a lot of flat tires. But she never pulled over in a remote area, making it harder to kidnap her because there was a chance of being discovered. They decided to attempt a different approach instead. Anderson approached Larissa on August 26 in the parking lot where they both worked. She was forced into his car while being held at knife point by him. Then Larissa was driven to Lake Vermilion by Anderson and Walker. Walker observed as Anderson took Larissa out of the car and repeatedly abused her once they got to the lake. Anderson allegedly turned a blind eye to Larissa's pleading for her life, according to Hazelwood and Mycord. Walker told police that Anderson strangled Larissa with duct tape and then buried her body beneath a choke tree bush in testimony he gave years after the occurrence about six weeks pregnant at the time of Larissa's passing. Walker admitted to authorities that he was a co-conspirator in the kidnapping of Larissa not long after Anderson was found guilty of abducting Piper in 1997. He claimed that he was not responsible for her assault or murder, but he did admit that he and Anderson meticulously planned and executed the kidnapping. Additionally, he promised to show the police where Larissa's body was. Walker directed the police to Larissa's unmarked, shallow burial at Lake Vermilion on May 20 of that year. They discovered that parts of her skeleton were missing when they dug up her remains. In 57 artifacts associated with Larissa, including a tooth, rib, left and right wrist bones, numerous fingers, a right foot and ankle, multiple fingernails, and jaw and neck bones, according to a 1999 Midwest News report, forensic experts were able to recover. A pair of work gloves, shell casings, bullets, Larissa's shoes, a portion of her belt, jewelry, and fragments of her clothing were also discovered at and close to the grave. The reason why only a portion of Larissa's body was in the grave confused the officials. The area was neatly covered over, so there were no indications that large creatures had disturbed it. A few months later, the cops would receive their justification from an unlikely source. Anderson's prison cellmate, Jeremy Brunner, 
reportedly got in touch with the Attorney General's office in August 1997 with information concerning Anderson's offences, according to a January 20, 2002 Aberdeen News article. In a one-week period during which they shared a cell, he claimed that Anderson boasted excessively and in great detail about the deaths of Piper and Larissa. They were able to obtain important information from Brunner that would further Anderson's accusation. Anderson admitted to being a serial killer, according to Brunner, who also said that the man stored mementos of his victims in his grandmother's home. Even the exact location of the objects was disclosed to Brunner. They were later discovered exactly where he had described them, tucked away in the basement of Anderson's grandmother, between the wall and the ceiling. Along with Anderson's rifle, the cash contained Piper and Larissa's rings and necklaces. Anderson told Brunner that he thought Walker may come forward with information regarding the killings. Walker would likely reveal the location of Larissa's body, he also had a hunch. Anderson made the decision to remove Larissa's skull and teeth from the shallow grave in order to keep the police from learning her identification if she were ever discovered, which could implicate him in the crime. The unearthed bones may have been tossed from Anderson's automobile as he sped away from the scene, according to Hazelwood and Mycord. The reason the police only found a part of Larissa's body was explained by Brunner's account. Brunner asserted that Anderson had boasted about kidnapping Piper as well. Anderson allegedly admitted to assaulting her, strangling her, and then dumping her body in the Big Sioux River, according to him. Witnesses claimed that on the day of Piper's disappearance, Anderson was seen by them numerous times. Brunner clarified that this was due to Anderson forgetting his watch and the tent, and him going back to the trailer to get them. Anderson urged Brunner to kill Walker during a different conversation because he didn't trust Walker and didn't believe he would keep quiet about the crimes. Anderson drew out two maps for Brunner after he gave his approval. The locations of Walker's home and Anderson's grandmother's residence were depicted on one of the maps and the other, respectively. He informed Brunner that he could find his gun in her basement. Brunner had promised to kill Walker when he was released from jail, but he had no plans to carry out his word. Instead, Brunner made a deal with the authorities in which he agreed to trade the data he had obtained for a reduced jail term. Another conviction was attained with the help of Brunner's testimony as well as that obtained from Walker and Hammer. The murder of Larissa Damansky was charged against Anderson on September 4, 1997. He was also accused of assaulting and killing Piper Stryl. In March 1999, his trial was supposed to get started. He would not have such good fortune this time. During the first week of March 1999, Anderson's trial was held in South Dakota's Minnehaha County Circuit Court. John A. Schlimgen and Mike Butler were the legal counsel handling his case. Judge Tim Dallas Tucker ruled over the case, while the prosecution was led by Deputy Attorney General Larry Long. The trial took place over the course of about one month. Shina's evidence was not heard during the hearings, although the court did get her account of what happened on July 29, 1996. Witnesses, Anderson's pals, and Brunner, one of his former cellmates, all gave testimony. There was a mountain of evidence against Anderson. There was no hope for the defenders. A jury of eight men and eight women quickly delivered its decision on April 6. Four counts, including the assault and murder of Piper and the kidnapping and murder of Larissa, led to Anderson's conviction. The same jury gave Anderson a fatal injection death sentence three days later. In March 2000, Anderson's friend, Walker went on trial for his crimes. He admitted to trying to kidnap Amy Anderson, being an accessory to kidnapping, murder in the first degree, and conspiring to kidnap Larissa Domansky. At the South Dakota State Penitentiary, he spent a total of 30 years in prison in a row. Anderson appealed his death sentence to the South Dakota Supreme Court in January 2002. The Aberdeen News reports that his attorneys included 18 issues in their appeal. A covered agreement between prosecutors and Jamie Hammer in exchange for testimony was one of the arguments put out. Anderson complained that he was not tried separately for the kidnapping and killing of Larissa, that he was not given the opportunity to confront Shina, and that he was not given the opportunity to address the jury before his punishment was determined. 
In March 2002, the Supreme Court convened to talk about Anderson's appeal. Anderson would never learn the outcome of the court's ruling, which would be made in May 2003. While awaiting the decision of his appeal, Robert Leroy Anderson killed himself on March 30. When Anderson was discovered hanging from a sheet fastened to a bar, Joe Kafka of the Associated Press said that he was not in his death row cell but was alone in a segregation cell. He was isolated because a razor blade was discovered in his possession. He probably acquired the blade to use as a tool for self-destruction. His father also committed suicide around three months before Anderson killed himself. He was shot in the head, and the bullet killed him. It's possible that his father's actions served as the impetus for him to commit suicide. Kafka described Piper's husband Vance as saying, This is what we were after anyhow. It just saved some time and effort, and Larry Long stated, There's a lot of women who will sleep better knowing that this guy is deceased. Anderson's appeal was denied by the South Dakota Supreme Court after he committed suicide. According to court records, they likely would have sustained Anderson's felony convictions in any case. The fact that he was aware that his appeal would be rejected could have contributed to his suicide as well.